today. Um, we'll just wait a minute for everybody to get into the webinar and get settled. Um, so yeah, we'll just give you guys a moment here. All right, I just see some people's things are still connecting to audio. Um, just get, give another minute and just see if anybody else is going to join in. Okay, well, yeah, I think um, we might still have some people joining, but um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so my name is Sarah Allison, and I'm the Recreation Coordinator with Horse Council of BC. And um, Dee Pollard is here today joining us from the UK, and she's a research analyst with the British Horse Society. And she'll be presenting today on the topic of equestrian road safety, um, kind of from the UK perspective. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, as well that the land where the HCBC office is located is on the traditional territories of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Matsqui, and Semi Amu First Nations. Um, myself and many others are attending virtually from other areas in BC. Um, and therefore, we'd like to acknowledge all Aboriginal peoples on whose traditional territories we're meeting today. And then just some housekeeping as well before we get started. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available just on our YouTube channel um, to watch at a later date. And um, we have everybody on mute and we're just hoping um, to keep you guys on mute and just to put any questions into the chat box. Um, we're leaving some time at the end of the presentation um, to answer those questions. And um, my coworker Jocelyn is here just to help with technology, um, just to have kind of a look at the chat box and help out. And um, yeah, we know everybody is busy, so we appreciate you guys taking the time today and we'll try and keep this um, presentation to an hour. And yeah, with that, I guess I'll pass it over to Dee and um, she'll maybe give us, tell us a little bit more about herself and um, yeah, get carried on with the presentation. All right, over to you, Dee. All right, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, yeah. I will share my screen now, hopefully. Um, so as uh, Sarah said, I work at the British Horse Society and um, I initially joined the society as a research analyst to look at a project specifically looking at equestrian road safety, um, which was funded by the Department for Transport. And it was a really interesting project. It's something that I was interested in anyway as an equestrian, but then being able to kind of do a research project around it was really uh, brilliant. So. The title of my talk is Vehicles Have Got Faster, But the Horse Has Stayed the Same Speed. So we already see that there's potential for conflict there because we have sort of a, a slow moving horse um, and vehicles that have gotten relatively faster over the years. Okay. Right, so we almost have seen sort of this dethroning of the horse. Um, from its uh, status as the king of the road. So it's not that long ago, maybe 120 years or so ago, that horses were predominantly used for most of our logistic um, needs and as well as our agricultural needs. And with the introduction of the motorized vehicles, um, and, we, and here on the left, we have this, the world's first car advertisement, and it says dispense with the horse, you don't need a horse anymore, save all the expense of feeding it, looking after it and get a car. Um, but we sometimes forget that um, roads were built for horses. In fact, um, in qu quite a few places, we still refer to roads as carriageways. Um, and while we can't dispute that sort of 
the the use of motorized vehicle has uh, perhaps uh, helped with uh, improving the welfare of our horses because if we think back, working horses had quite a hard life really, and they still do in some parts of the world. Um, if you you probably might remember back to Anna Sewell's Black Beauty and sort of her experience of the taxicab horses in London inspired her to write the book. So we can't dispute that. Yes, horses have probably a much better life nowadays than they did when they were used to transport uh, people and goods um, and going into wars and so on. But with that, we um, have a whole new set of problems. So modern vehicles have become much uh, faster, quieter and safer for the people inside the vehicles. Uh, but not necessarily for other road users on the roads. So just to set the scene, because I am originally from South Africa and then moved to uh, the UK. So there is some terminology that I'll use that you might not be familiar with in Canada. So um, if you hear the uh, term called hacking, we are not using computers to breaking and breaking into um, secret uh, code bases but uh, that probably translates to sort of trail or pleasure riding. And usually in the UK, it means using a combination of off-road routes um, and roads. Um, the term rights of way. So these are specific designated routes in the UK um, that the public can use. Um, and they can go either over private land or over public land. And they can also be public or permissive. So public routes, are there sort of in perpetuity, um, anyone can use them. And permissive ones can be taken away at any time by the landowner. So they are there just by permission of the landowner. Uh, we have in the UK what is called the definitive rights of way map. So this is a map where we have all our public rights of way recorded. Um, and in, in essence, the rights of way that are recorded on this map are sort of considered safe. So they are there in perpetuity, they can't be extinguished. And this map is constantly being updated because we have a lot of historic rights of way that have not been recorded on, on this map. Um, and so some of the work that the BHS is involved in um, through uh, staff and volunteers is to do historical research into these rights of way. Um, you have to then put an application into the government and you have to provide a lot of evidence to say that Yes, at some point, 100 years ago, this was used by horses regularly, and therefore it should be um, a pub, uh, should be recorded on the definitive map as a public right of way um, that is accessible to horses. Um, and road users, of course, anyone that uses the public road network, so this can include vehicle drivers, cyclists, motorcyclists, equestrians, pedestrians, and so on. So a little bit more of setting the scene. So we have four main types of public rights of way, and this covers in England and Wales. Scotland has slightly different legislation. So in Scotland, essentially, there is no restriction on who can use rights of way. They almost have this sort of right to roam, um, which is quite nice, um, as long as it is done responsibly and they follow the sort of countryside code. So as in, if you go through a gate, you need to close it and taking rubbish with them and so on. So they have um, much more opportunity to go off road in Scotland. In England and Wales, we have um, footpaths, which are um, legally only open to pedestrians. So walking, uh, this does include mobility scooters and powered wheelchairs as well. Then the next step up is bridleways or bridle paths. And these are legally open for walking, horse riding, and cycling. Um, the next step up is restricted byways. So these are open to all the above, including carriage driving. So carriage drivers technically are not allowed on bridleways. And then the next step up is byways open to all traffic. Um, and these are open to everyone, including motorized vehicles, but they're mainly used uh, by walkers, cyclists, and uh, horse riders and carriage drivers. So um, on the right, I just have some um, signage, which kind of gives example of uh, bridleway signs that um, might be displayed throughout the UK. 
Um, and then below is a restricted byway sign, which sort of clearly shows who is allowed to use the restricted byway. So there are some restrictions, um, but in essence, it is great that we have this network of um, off-road rights of way available to us. However, out of all those rights of way, which is a massive network, horse riders only have access to about 22% of them. So only about 22% are bridleways. And then carriage drivers, even less, so only have access to about 5% of rights of way. So only about 5% are um, byways or restricted byways. So that does put some limitations on um, what we can use and where depends on some regions of the country have really good networks, some have hardly anything, others have sort of hotspots of uh, routes, but essentially most of the time we have to use roads to get to and travel between these rights of way. Some of the other problems with rights of way is nature. So you, you can, after storms, you can get sort of trees falling and blocking rights of way. Um, and then, I don't know if you can see on the right, but we did manage to sneak past because um, the advantage of being on a little pony is that you can get off and then lead them under obstacles that aren't um, too low. We also get overgrown paths. So um, this was one where there was a lot of sort of thorny um, roses and other kind of thorny plants that have overgrown. Um, it was possible, but you would get quite a few scratches. So I just opted to get off and lead the horse through. Um, and the thing with these rights of way, so there is responsibility um, on the landowner to keep them open and possible, and also on the local authority, depending on where you are, because as they are public rights of way, they are sort of covered by the, the, um, the local authority of the government in that area. So there is ways that you can report problems like this, but it just depends on sort of when they get around to doing anything about it, which can be relative quick, relatively quickly, or it can take months. And then we have another problem here. Um, so people dumping rubbish, what we call fly tipping here in the UK. And you can see on the right, this is a bridleway sign. And this is a gate that's actually um, designed to stop vehicles, but horses can step over it quite easily. And then somebody has dumped all their rubbish there. So obviously this is not very safe um, to pass through with your horse because you don't really know what's in that rubbish. So then we also get onto sort of the characteristic of our rural roads in the UK. A lot of them are single track roads. Um, on the left, um, you can see there's sort of a lot of vegetation. Uh, in the left picture and on the left you can also, I don't know if you can see, but there's a barbed wire fence um, along the left hand side there and kind of ste a steep bank with lots of trees. So um, if you meet a vehicle coming around in the opposite direction, especially around a blind bend, if they're going too fast, um, it can sort of cause the horse to uh, spook and um, or even worse, um, that could lead to a collision. In the middle, this is kind of the area I live in at the moment. So it's very flat, very straight roads. So you've got good visibility. But on the left, you actually have a ditch here full of water. And just ahead, um, up ahead, you can see there's a little bridge. So um, the problem with flat, straight roads is that people tend to go faster on them because it's sort of they think, well, I can see all around me. So um, I'll just speed down the road. And you don't actually have a lot of places to go because if you try to go to the left, you might fall down into the ditch. And on the right hand side, we have sort of a typical country lane, very high hedging. So you can't see really anything coming around the corner and they can't see you. So once again, um, we have these kind of narrow, lots of vegetation, sometimes windy roads. Um, and this is where most equestrians will ride. And usually um, they're not too busy. However, sometimes they can be used as cut throughs um, if there are roadworks on the main roads, et cetera. So sometimes you do get quite a bit of traffic um, through them. 
And another thing is the speed limit of our rural roads. So many of them actually are designated the national speed limit, which in the UK is 60 miles per hour on a single carriageway roads, which includes most of our rural roads. Um, usually if you're getting into a village or somewhere that's more residential, um, it'll drop down to 30 miles per hour. But sort of out in the country, it is 60 miles per hour, which equates to about 97 kilometers per hour. So I know speed limits don't necessarily mean that people will go that speed. It's an upper limit. But we do find that sort of the higher the speed limit, the faster people tend to go. Um, if you lower the speed limit, then the range of speedings will be lower. So for example, if the speed limit is 60 miles an hour, and you go 65 miles an hour, you'll think, oh, you know, it's not too much over the speed limit, even 70, you know, it's that, 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 not that far away from 60. However, if your speed limit is lower 30, then you might go or oh, 35 miles an hour, that's still okay, maybe 40, but sort of your upper limit is gonna be lower, I think, just psychologically how people think. So we also have to remember that on these really narrow roads, um, perceptions of speed can differ between individuals. So what I think is slow might not be what someone else thinks it's slow or safe um, to pass someone, especially um, in close quarters. So this is an example of just one of these um, narrow roads where a vehicle coming around the corner can spook the horses. And you can see there's not a lot of space there really and no way um, for the horses to go to get out of the way. So with this sort of expansion of housing developments and so on, um, especially in the UK, land is pretty much at a premium in some places more than others. Um, but we often see these kind of harsh transitions from countryside into kind of more developed areas or um, faster roads. So for example, you can have um, a byway or a bridleway that is suddenly bisected by a, a, a road, which is like one of the sort of main roads before a motorway, where speed limits can be um, 60, 70 miles an hour, and they're relatively busy roads as well. So in an ideal world, when we have this happening, we would have these safe crossings. Um, so these are examples of Pegasus crossings. So they're designed specifically for equestrians to use. And we do have them in some areas of the country, but they are very expensive to um, put in. And a lot of local authorities are not keen to spend that much money. So uh, with these, we can see we have this sort of higher um, buttons that equestrians can push without having to lean over too much, especially if you're on a large horse. We have these kind of um, fenced off holding areas um, where horses can wait without um, perhaps um, getting onto the road on the sides. Um, and so they're kind of the ideal of what we want to see um, when we're crossing busy roads. Okay, however, this is usually what happens. So this is a, a public uh, byway and that's bisected by uh, our road. Um, very busy road. There's no traffic farming either side. Um, and unless you know that there's a byway there, um, then it's very difficult as a car driver to know that someone might come out. Okay, so essentially, I think we've, we waited almost two minutes um, to cross this road. Um, and the cars don't really tend to slow down when they go past either. So it's not the most pleasant road to cross. Um, granted, you have relatively good visibility. Um, but it is a road that you have to um, cross twice on this particular route. Um, so it's not 
not the nicest experience. Okay. So how do we sort of um, find out what's going on in the real world? So a lot of those sort of videos and things I've shown you um, of sort of my experiences and what other people have sent in to us so that it's very anecdotal. So how do we get kind of the real evidence to show that there is a problem and where the problem is. So we are very lucky in the UK that we can sort of extract some of these data. And I'll just quickly run through the four main sources of data that we can use. So the first one is the National Health Service publishes these hospital episode statistics. They're only for England. Um, and it shows us numbers of hospital um, admittances uh, due to animal rider or occupant of animal drawn vehicles uh, injured in transport incidents. So it's very kind of um, sort of low level summary. So we have, I think, some demographics and the numbers each year. And these get published publicly um, and we can extract that data. So the next um, step is the police recorder data. So these are. Um, collisions on the road that have been reported to the police. Police may not always attend them. And these um, are only recorded if there are human injuries. Um, and we can extract some ridden horse data from these. The only ridden horses, they don't, they do record other types of like uh, for carriage drivers and other types of um, horses on roads, but they tend to be sort of squirreled away in the other section and we can't um, extract those. So only ridden horses. The next step is um, the BHS horse incidents database. So we have been since 2010 collecting incidents involving horses on roads. And these don't have to be injury incidents. They can um, be non-injury incidents such as near misses. Um, so close passes or just any kind of um, road rage that's directed at equestrians. And these can be submitted by the public, either someone that's been involved in the incidents or even someone that's witnessed it. And we also collect data about not only human injury, but also horse injury. And we collect data on ridden horses, um, carriage driven horses. Um, we do have some um, populations of sort of semi-feral uh, horses that live in nature reserves in the UK, for example, for example, um, Exmoor and Dartmoor. And um, we do collect uh, when these horses are involved in collisions as well. So, and then finally, we have the data collected via research projects, such as um, I'll talk about a little bit about the projects I was involved in. So we do have um, these different data sets. They all tell us slightly different things. And so it's really hard to compare them, but there is some overlap between them. So if we look at the, um, the hospital episode statistics, so between 2011 and 2020, there were 34,000, over 34,000 hospital admissions in England alone due to this animal rider or occupant of animal drawn vehicle injured in a transport accident. So that's quite a lot that averages to about almost 4,000 per year. So we know um, from research into cycling and walking, we know that real or perceived traffic risk is a significant barrier to people wanting to walk or cycle. Um, we know that it limits exercise trips and that it affects general well-being. And we've found that similar perceptions influence equestrians' decisions around whether they use roads and then this, of course, has the potential to limit exercise sessions for both, both the humans and the horses, and then negatively impact their health and well-being. And of course, this then lead, feeds back into the whole healthcare system, because um, in, in the UK, the healthcare system is subsidized by the government. So the government ends up spending more money. Um, and of course, you might have more veterinary costs because we have things like um, equine obesity and laminitis because horses are not being exercised as much as they potentially could. So it's a, it's a little bit of a stretch to say that, but I think we have some evidence that does point towards that and I'll, and I'll cover it just now. Now, what does the police recorded data tell us? So between a similar period, so remember the hospital statistics tells us that there's 34,000 
or more injuries between 2011 and 2020. So if we look at police recorded collision data between 2010 and 2019, there are only 1,000, just over a thousand police recorded injury incidents involving ridden horses. Um, these involved um, just over 2,000 people because there's usually multiple people involved and multiple road users involved. Um, there were 18 fatalities recorded within this period and 17 out of those 18 fatalities uh, were horse riders, if we look on the graph here. And when we look also at the severity of injuries, so these are just interactions between uh, ridden horses and other road users. We can see that horse riders were most likely to be slightly or seriously injured, and of course to sustain fatal injuries in these incidents. We can also have a look at of those horse riders that were seriously or fatally injured, who were the other road users that were involved? And in most of the cases, so over 50% of the cases, it was other car drivers. Then we have sort of vans or light, light goods vehicles, some agricultural vehicles, um, heavy goods vehicles, like your big articulated lorries and so on, motorcycles, pedal cycles, and so on. So actually the main culprits seem to be our vehicle um, or car drivers. Okay, so massive difference between um, the number of people actually getting injured and going to hospital and the number of um, incidents being reported to police. What does the BHS, BHS incidents tell us? So remember BHS collects both um, injury and non-injury incidents. So within sort of a similar time period between 2010 and 2020, we received just over 4,000 um, incidents reported to us. So still under reporting compared to the hospital statistics, but a bit better than the police record records. And out of these um, 4,000 incidents, 84% of them in involved a close pass, 40% involved, well, I should say perceived speeding, obviously you can't tell um, exactly how fast someone is going, but it was, um, the, these people were perceived to be exceeding the speed limit and 40% involved some sort of road rage directed at the equestrian and their horse, whether it was sort of um, bad language being shouted, um, revving the car, beep, um, beefing the horn, tailgating or something like that. So we had um, 151 of these incidents that resulted in either the horse or the rider sustaining a fatal injury. More, most often it was the horse. Um, and we use these data then to identify factors associated with collisions and horse fatalities. And we can see on the map on the right, we do have some hot spots. And so data like this is really good at kind of telling us where the problem areas are and kind of what the, the most common problems are that equestrians are um, experiencing on the roads. So from our, our work looking at the factors, uh, we know that close passes significantly increase the risk of a collision. And we also know that collision, um, collisions and speeding together were associated with a higher risk of a horse fatality. So that kind of makes sense. And, and then yet we still question why we have such high speed limits um, on our rural road network. And this is an example of a close pass. So you can see the vehicle on the other side is waiting patiently, um, but the lorry decides that he's not going to wait and he just goes for it. I'll bet slowly, but really closely. Um, and luckily that horse remained calm and so did the rider, but um, had it been another horse or another rider, it, couldn't, it could have sort of resulted in some serious injury. Um, and of course, we unfortunately have examples of fatal incidents um, for the horses, and these happened just last year. Um, so one that was um, hit from behind and actually a hit and run. And then the one on the right, it was actually a police horse out on patrol. So I think this doesn't give people a lot of confidence when a police horse out on patrol gets hit by a car um, and then ends up being put down. 
Okay, so now we sort of, we have that background information and now um, we'll move on to kind of some of the research that I was involved in. So first, what we wanted to do was establish, okay, so how often do equestrians actually use roads? Um, so we did a survey and we received just short of 6,000 responses, which was brilliant. We didn't expect that, but I think this was such an important topic to some people that they, um, that we had really good uh, response. So 84% of the people in our survey used roads at least once per week. And um, we found that actually it wasn't just for riding. Uh, we had people carry driving, we had people walking their horses in hand, um, or riding and leading another horse, or walking um, with their child on a pony. So um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about is kind of focused on horse riders, but actually we have a lot of these other activities that take place on roads as well. So of these equestrians, 68% had experienced a near miss in the previous year. And this is kind of similar to one or two other research studies that ha had, had been done in sort of more uh, regional areas of the UK. And 6% um, sustained an injury. So e injury either to themselves or their, ho or their horse in a previous year due to a road related incident. <coughs> Excuse me. And actually 6% said that they no longer use roads anymore. And we kind of asked them to give us a bit more information as to why they don't use any roads anymore. And we found that as the diagram on the left sort of goes through, it was this decision based on individual assessment of risk. So we had people mention different things that fed into each other that led to their decision to no longer use roads with their horse. So there, were, um, there was risk perception, which was sort of feelings of danger and, and, and being unsafe and saying that they value their horse too much to sort of put them at that risk, uh, whether that had previous negative experiences. And it doesn't always have to be them personally. It could be a friend of theirs or them having witnessed someone else have a bad experience that had sort of put them back. Um, it was also the behavior of other road users. So they often felt that um, a lot of people did sort of unsafe overtaking maneuvers and didn't uh, respect the horse. And there was a lack of education about why um, you needed to behave in a certain way around a horse. There was also obviously things like in increasing traffic volumes um, on certain roads and the types of vehicles on certain roads. We had the characteristics of the road itself so as I said, narrow, windy roads, um, the road surfaces were sometimes slippery, depending on what surface there was, poor visibility and speed limits of the roads. Um, there was whether they had um, access to alternative options. If they had access to off-road places, then they would use those preferably. Um, but as I said, they often had to use roads to get there. Some people actually moved yards because they said that road use was such a problem that they actually moved um, to a yard that was further away from them, but because just so they didn't have to ride on roads. Um, and we also, of course, had the horse-human partnership. So we all know that um, horses can sort of feel our emotions. And there was a really brilliant study that they did where um, they had a person riding a horse around an arena and they said to the person, okay, ride three times around. And on the third time, there's going to be a person standing next to the arena and they're going to open an umbrella. And so the person was riding around once, twice, and third time they rode around and they were anticipating this umbrella being opened. And even though the umbrella wasn't opened, they monitored um, sort of the response of the horse and the person. And they, they found that as soon as the person started anticipating that something scary was going to happen and translated down into the horse. So a lot of the time it can be sort of how much confidence we have, how much trust we have in our horse, um, the horse's own experiences and training and, and how they react to certain things. Okay, <clears throat> so we've now established that road use is very common in the UK. We then wanted to look at more kind of road safety and uh, in particular. So we did another survey, which 
um, asked about how, how risky or risk perception of using roads. And we also wanted to know how, you know, what the main problems were and how um, um, stressed or anxious people felt when using roads. So we had an even better response on the survey. We had uh, over 7,000 responses, which was brilliant. So on the left is just um, kind of a risk perception assessment. So we asked people to rate how risky they felt each of these different equestrian activities were. Starting from sort of, you know, just simple things like leading your horse to and from a turnout area, routine handling, um, in hand activities, flat work sessions, jumping, um, you see the word hacking, hacking on roads, hacking off roads, um, things like, you know, cross country, so activities including jumping in an open space. And we can see that where people sort of rated risk the highest was hacking um, on roads, carriage driving on roads, and in hand activities on roads. Um, only 3% of people said that they didn't feel stressed or anxious at all when using roads. And 43% said that they felt stress, stressed or anxious more than half of the time that they used roads. And the main contributors to the stress and anxiety were the behavior of other road users, the characteristics of the road, and the volume of road users on the roads. So now we're building this, this evidence base. So we also then looked at um, incident reporting. So we know there is massive underreporting. How do we get people um, to give us better reports so we have a better idea of, what, of what's going on out there? So about 31% of people said that they had previously reported an incident to the police or the BHS. However, 78% said that they had experienced at least one incident, and most actually experienced more than 10, that they did not report. So we were almost kind of seeing this normalization of certain incidents. And some people said that on certain roads, you know, you're constantly being overtaken close and fast, and eventually you can't really physically report every single car and every single incident and it almost became normal and you know on that road people are going to do that so it, it doesn't sort of become um, not almost not scary but surprising anymore and actually we found that there was that road use was a barrier to exercise so we asked some questions in here to see um, how a road use might impact their ability to exercise exercise their horses. So over 90% of respondents agreed that exercise was important for their horse. However, 60% felt that having to use a crossroads limited their ability to exercise their horse. And also 60 to 70% thought that they would cover greater distances and exercise their horses more if they felt safer on roads. So we are seeing this effect of um, roads being uh, perceived as risky, um, in impacting how we exercise our horses and ourselves. Now, a lot of people have started using cameras. So we have asked some questions about camera use. So 22% of respondents said that they wore cameras when using road with their horses. Um, the highest proportion of camera usage was in carriage drivers and lowest in riders. So um, we also saw that Sort of not having a camera or sort of not having this evidence was a barrier to um, reporting an incident. So 15% of reported incidents had video footage versus 5% of non-reported incidents. So it's unfortunate that you know we have to in this day and age use cameras um, to gather this evidence but um, some police forces now do accept um, incident reporting via um, a website where you can actually upload your video footage. Um, and then in that way, if you have the registration of the car, um, then there is some kind of repercussion, uh, whether they just, uh, whether that uh, road user just gets a talking to or, or a fine or something worse. But um, often if you do report an incident, but you have no evidence or you can't identify who it is, then there's not much that anyone or the police can do about it. So 
camera uh, usage is becoming more um, common. However, when we spoke to equestrians, they, they did have concerns about camera placage, uh, placement. So some were concerned about placing it on their helmets. So um, everyone kind of uh, brought up the, the unfortunate case of Michael Schumacher and when he was skiing and he had the, um, the helmet uh, camera on his head and whether that contributed to um, worsening his injuries. So there was some concern if you did fall off onto the camera, how that might affect um, any injuries or even the integrity of your helmet. Um, and that's why maybe we're seeing kind of carriage drivers using cameras more because they can actually mount it on their carriage rather than on themselves. But there are different sort of um, kind of bids. You can um, have uh, like uh, chest cameras and things like that. So there are different options that don't have to go on your helmet. Some people did also mention the cost of cameras. Uh, they can, some, the good ones can be quite pricey. Um, and also like the technology associated with setting them up, knowing how to transfer videos from the camera um, to your computer and so on. Okay. So apart from just doing um, surveys, we also uh, did focus groups and interviews with equestrians. So we tried to kind of see uh, what road safety meant to them. What are some of the things they did to mitigate risk um, and how they thought that safe uh, road safety could be improved. So roads were seen as a value system. So everybody has, has to work together to co-create safety. And there are rules that should be followed, but if not everyone follows the rules, then that can obviously upset the balance and um, compromise safety. So equestrians were very much um, keen on promoting use of responsible, predictable, and clear behaviors. So they took a, a lot of the lion's share responsibility on their shoulders. They, they tried to make sure that they're visible and you see some of the minimizing risk um, strategies. There were several different strategies people use, such as using high visibility clothing. Um, so uh, trying to communicate with other road users um, and just being sort of good, responsible road citizens. Um, but because you're kind of not thinking just of yourself, you have your horse as well, yourself and the other road users. Um, and this often led to equestrians not feeling like legitimate road users, which kind of goes back to the, like the dethroning of the horse. So horses used to um, use roads most of the time. Um, they were sort of the kings of the road. And now they've kind of been um, relegated to, to somewhere perhaps even below cyclists. So this then led to problems. Um, and also because, as I said, we have to think about the horse. It's not just us and the other road user. Horses have their own personalities, their own um, innate behaviors and things that they like or don't like. And sometimes they can be unpredictable, as we all know. Um, they don't follow our rules, unfortunately. Um, and so that means that it might not always be the other road user that is issue, but if you're, you're not given enough space or if the other road user doesn't slow down enough, it could be sort of a rabbit in the hedge or a pheasant that scares the horse, which then makes it move sideways. So if there's not enough space there, then that can lead to a problem. And that kind of leads on to other ro road users not being familiar with horses which if you weren't brought up around horses, you might not know how quickly they move and also what scares them and what doesn't. Um, and kind of just the, the, the behavioral, um, sort of the body language of a horse. Not everybody knows that uh, snorting and you know wide eyes uh, means that the horse is scared. Um, and we all, of course have the different, different physical positioning. So cars tend to be sort of, unless you're on a small pony, tend to be a bit lower down. You perhaps on a big horse have more visibility about what's going on around you. Sometimes you might be able to see around the hedge that someone is oncoming. Um, so we have this different sort of physical viewpoint of the environment. And as one, um, one of the equestrians said, drivers aren't aware of what we see and hear on a horse. They're in their little bubble. Um, and it's also trying to get into the thought waves of a horse. So how do we teach non-equestrians about horse behavior? Um, 
So I won't go too much into minimizing risk because we'll do that next. But I think kind of the quote of this equestrian sums up this, this feeling of massive responsibility. So she says, I find when I'm riding, I'm not only doing my own risk assessment in my head um, about how I might react to something, but I'm also doing the risk assessment of the car coming towards me because I don't know if he will do his. And so how can we sort of work together to improve road safety? So we have to make the road network more inclusive. It's very much geared towards um, motorized vehicles, but horses, cyclists, pedestrians, and so on, we all have a legal right to use the road network. We need education and behavior change campaigns, and we need to think carefully about these because they need to um, get to the right target audience, and we need to um, do them in a way that's actually going to change behavior. Um, we all of course have rules and legislation, and these, um, I'll go into that a little bit now, and then, of course, it's important to report incidents because then we know where they are and what's happening. And I quite like this um, quote on the left. So one of the kind of pillars of behavior change is using positive reinforcement. So this equestrian said, our local bridleways group actually sent Christmas cards to our local bus drivers who slow down, um, and that really works. So it's kind of getting this really good relationship going with other road users in the areas. So what do equestrians do to minimize risk? So as, as I mentioned, um, wearing of high visibility clothing and or light. So on the bottom right, you can see um, a person out on a dark horse on sort of a pretty dark day um, and how visible they are in their clothing compared to when they're not wearing the high visibility clothing on the right. So that's, while it's not going to um, help you in a situation where someone is really driving without due care and attention, it can help some more responsible um, road users see you earlier and respond and react earlier. Um, obviously building a good relationship with your horse, making sure that you are confident, that your horse is confident, um, building them up, getting them used to different vehicles, um, machine, machinery and so on from a young age if possible, and then, of course, if you're not confident going out alone, then going out with a friend or someone on a more confident horse and, and knowing your limits and your horse's limits as well. Um, and some people decided to avoid known potential hazards. So, for example, if it was really bad weather and low visibility, they wouldn't go on the road. Um, avoiding peak traffic times and busy times. Um, avoiding bin collection days, for example, because you might um, meet a bin lorry out and about, or um, for example, harvest time in agricultural areas where you're gonna meet a lot of agricultural uh, machinery. And of course, communication. And now uh, communication is an interesting one because amongst equestrian circles, we tend to know what these hand signals mean, but they're not always very well known by other vehicle drivers. Um, and I think, because I looked this up, but I think you might have slightly different hand signal suggestions um, in Canada. Um, you might correct me if I'm wrong. So in the UK, kind of, if you're turning right, you point your arm right. If you're turning left, you point your arm left. Uh, stop is stop. And then a slow down is arm out to the side, waving up and down. And it's particularly that slowing down sign we find when you're waving your um, arm up and down, that people then in a car then just tend to wave back at you um, rather than slowing down. So there is this kind of miscommunication going on. How do we make the road network more inclusive? So um, if you uh, were at the brilliant talk by Neil Aronson, where he spoke about kind of the systems approach and the safe systems approach, and kind of that separation in time and space is ideal. So if you have bridleways that are physically separated from roads, I mean, that's probably the safest you can get. Um, uh, separation in time, so having Pegasus crossing, crossings, for example, where cars have to stop, which allows horses to pass. So that's, that's great. And as someone that spent um, a, a, a lot of years, not a lot of years, three or four years living in Germany and the Netherlands, um, and they have a fantastic network of cycle tracks 
I mean, you practically never have to go on the road. And um, I mean, that's the ideal if you have that infrastructure in place. If you don't, then you do still need to consider the needs of all road users rather than just focusing, for example, on cars. And um, we have to make sure that safety infrastructure is evidence-based and that it actually promotes safety. So a really interesting study done in the UK looked at kind of what increases risk of bicycle collisions in certain areas. And they found that actually these bicycle lanes that are just drawn on to the side of roads were actually more risky than not having that at all. So while that might be a really cheap option, you know, to just go paint some lines and say, okay, this is a designated place for bicycles. It was actually more risky because you had often cars parking in these areas. So cyclists had to kind of weave in between parked cars. Sometimes these just then disappeared, especially at junctions. And also essentially the, the theory behind the psychology of it is that um, with this designated cycleway, cars then perhaps of car drivers should i say not cars then perhaps thought that they didn't actually need to slow down because well the bicycle is in its lane even though it's still in the road but i'm not really going to slow down because they're in their place and i'm in mine and people will actually tend to be more careful um, when cyclists were just um, riding on roads without these designated marks and of course the safest would be to have some kind of physical barrier between the road and the cycleway. So we must remember um, before we go, or local authorities should remember before they go and spend a lot of money on sort of things that they think will in, improve safety and they actually might not do anything or even worse, they might do the opposite and actually promote um, incidents and collisions. So we do need a lot of research in that area. Education and behavior change theory. So. As I said, we need to make sure that our education reaches the target audience. A lot of the time we feel like we're preaching to the converted. We talk to a lot of equestrians and they all say, yes, we know, we know what the issues are, but how do we change things? So some of the things are like, for example, uh, the BHS has this Henry the Horse campaign and basically they're going to schools. So targeting sort of our future drivers um, or road users and starting it off at a young age and telling them about horses and how horses behave and how they should behave around horses then sets up that kind of future generation and hopefully maybe perhaps if they're in the car with their parents and their parents approach a horse and they say actually mom or dad this is how you should pass a horse when you meet one on the road so we also know kind of the behavior change theory we have to make um, the right thing to do easy or pleasant and the hard um, and the wrong thing to do hard or unpleasant. So sort of one of the examples of pleasant things that I'm quite a big fan of is these vehicle activated speeding signs. So they kind of tell you your speed and if you're good and you're below the speed limit, they give you a little smiley face and you kind of feel quite validated and yeah, you know, I've done good. Um, and they change if you are over the speed limit, they'll show the speed limit and then it'll be a sad face. So that's kind of something that's quite interactive. And research has found that people do respond to that for a certain period of time. So actually, if you move these around, they have more impact than if you leave them in one place, because people will pay attention to them for maybe a week or two, and then you'll kind of see that response actually tapering off. So per permanent signs actually, and static signs don't have as much effect as these dynamic signs. Um, so, we also know in behavior change theory that a lot of the time promoting and reinforcing good behavior gets us better results than kind of punishing bad behavior. So it's kind of the carrot versus the stick theory. So uh, when we have these shared um, rights of way, um, we have this campaign which is called Be Nice and Say Hi. And we work together with the cycling community to promote this so that when people do meet each other out on the trails, um, we kind of promote this good communication between them, you know, telling cyclists to call out when they're coming up behind a horse and so on. So there's certain ways in which this can be done. Um, reporting of incidents, of course, as I said, is important to kind of build up this evidence base 
it gives us information on where incidents are occurring and what sort of incidents, and also then helps us to involve other road safety stakeholders, because we have this data and we can go to them and say, listen, in this particular area, you know, equestrians are having a lot of problems with traffic. So what can we do about it? So one of the things that BHS does is work with local authorities and equestrians in certain areas. And we put up these dead slow signs, uh, which that 15 has now changed to 10. I'll mention it in the next slide. So they actually tell a, a, a motorist what to do when they see a horse on the road. So slow down to, it's now 10, mile, 10 miles an hour and give at least two meters distance when passing. And these are temporary signs. So they'll go up in certain areas and then they'll get taken down and then they'll go up in other areas. So, and we also have actually created an app where people can download their incidents, uh, download. They can report their incidents via an app, which makes it really quick and easy to report an incident. So we're trying to kind of make reporting as easy and quick for people to do so that we get that data. Guidance rules and legislation. So obviously these should be re reviewed regularly and amended as necessary. And they should involve all representatives from all relevant stakeholders. We know, um, particularly now after the pandemic, there's been a lot of focus on kind of mental health and well-being and um, active and green travel. And a lot of the focus is on walking and cycling. And so a lot of the time we have to go in and say, well, don't forget about us equestrians. So although we're not essentially active travel per se, we are still a form of green exercise, um, improving well-being, doing exercise outdoors. And for some, they do sort of use horses to do things like go to the post office and maybe go to the, to the little shop to get some milk and things like that. So technically it could be classed as active um, trouble. However, rules, legislation and guidance has to be enforced in some way. It doesn't have to sort of lead to um, jail time or serious things, but even just discussions, um, warnings or so for speeding now, instead of kind of taking points of people's licenses, you can go to a speed awareness course, which actually a lot of people say is a really good course that have been. Um, and guidance should be clear and specific. So one example is that we have our official highway code in the UK, which um, gives rules and guidance about all sorts of um, different things to all road users and how to behave on the road. So there was a public consultation on because they, they reviewed the highway code and they suggested some changes. Um, and after some time, they did include us equestrians. And they also, uh, so there, some changes were suggested and these then went out to public consultation and came back. And actually we were able to sort of um, develop this new hierarchy where we, so this basically says that people that can, do most harm on roads have the most responsibility. So the most vulnerable and kind of um, the people who, sh who shoot, obviously everyone has to um, act responsibly, but who the most vul vulnerable are at the top of the hierarchy. So these are pedestrians, cyclists and equestrians, motorcyclists, and then it, go down, then it goes down to uh, the other vehicle drivers. And also we actually managed to include guidance on how to pass and specific guidance on how to pass horses safely on roads. So this is just guidance. However, um, in the event of it leading to sort of serious injury to someone, um, it could then be referred to um, in a legal case to say, well, you know, to argue the fact that um, the other road user was not driving with due care and attention because they did not follow the guidance in the highway code about how to pass a horse safely on the road. So the guidance at the moment says, to reduce your speed to 10 miles an hour and, and to uh, pass the horse slowly at this speed um, and allow at least two meters of space between the vehicle and the horse. And obviously we know this is not always achievable on our very narrow country lanes. You might not be able to get two meters in, but um, it says do not overtake if it is not safe to do so. So that's the important bit, sort of just using common sense and also letting the equestrian guide you because, you know, if they say, you know, don't go yet because my horse is not happy, then don't go. Or if they say, no, it's okay for you to pass, um, 
then obviously we need that communication. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Um, this is a slide of just references and um, any further info, if anybody wanted to look up any of the studies or uh, the, B uh, the work that the VHS does. Um, and thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Dee. Um, I know we are running a little bit over time, so we're at one o'clock now. Um, if anybody does have to run off, um, my email is recreation at hcbc.ca. Um, and if you want to send me questions, I can always send them to Dee as well um, after. But um, if anybody is able to stay um, and wants to ask a question, um, just pop it into the chat box. And I'm just going to type my email in here as well. So yeah, that's there. So yeah, we'll just wait um, to see if there's any questions. And D, um, do you mind if I share your um, slides as well with people? Um, no, that's fine. What I can do is I can save it as a PDF and okay. I can send it to you because then Perfect. there's a lot of videos and pictures in there. So it might be a yeah. nice file. Yeah, and I think I noticed somebody mentioned in the chat they were um, wanting to read the signs and stuff as well in the presentation. So if I send it out um, to them and stuff, that, that would be great. Um, yeah, and then also we have a section on our website. Um, it's like a resource section as well under the recreation tab. So I can put the slides in there um, kind of for, for future and everything. Yeah, so I'll just give you guys a minute. Oh, yeah, it looks like we have a comment here uh, from Audrey. And she's saying that was a very thought provoking and useful presentation. Thank you for that. Oh, cool. um, so maybe I can ask everyone a question that's still here, sort of how um, how often do you tend to use roads with your horses and do you experience the same sort of thing in, in Canada? Yeah, if you guys just want to pop that in the chat. Yeah, and I think I have sort of chatted to Sarah a little bit about, um, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't take much to just do like a quick, you know, quick, short survey um, of equestrians in BC and see, you know, what their experiences are. And um, I, I'd be happy to, to help you out with that if you needed a hand or. Yeah. It's yeah. just a little starting point kind of to see, you know, are there issues, what are the issues and where. Mm -hmm, mm hmm exactly yeah um I just have another one coming through um it's from Caroline Rolls um seeing oh yeah she's just saying um it'd be great to kind of duplicate um some of the research here in in BC and everything um and she likes the education temporary science that um, when we have a club event underway, they're mindful to include um, road and trail users. So yeah, just kind of a, a comment there. Um, and then um, Susan, um, she says, I volunteer with the therapeutic riding program and we don't have an arena. So our lessons are take place on the road as a trail ride. 90% of the drivers are great, but it's always scary with the ones who aren't. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it can only only take that one or two mm -hmm. people that you meet to to make a real impact or even sort of, you know, result in a collision or something. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, and then Ruth, um, she says in Vancouver, Canada, we use the roads a lot. And although in the horse friendly areas, the speed limit is reduced to 30 kilometers, people still speed. Yeah, so we are still seeing issues with people going over speed limit. Um, and Caroline just says the pass wide and slow Facebook group is great. A real emphasis on use of the camera in Britain. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, and then um, Pam Harrison, um, Pam's with um, the Livable Roads for Rural Sandage. Um, it's just a community on um, Vancouver Island. Um, and they conducted a very local survey of equestrians and other vulnerable 
vulnerable road users, um, perceptions and experiences, and over 300 responses um, from many, and um, indicated a large degree of concern about safety when using public roads to get to the equestrian pass and presented it to their council. So yeah, um, livable roads for real sand and gem. Pam's here representing them. It's good to see you, Pam. <laughs> and um, yeah, they do they do great work and um, have yeah put together surveys and everything. Um, unfortunately, that's just one small section of our province, so we don't have that province wide yet, but um, it would be great to see more of that sort of thing happening around the province for sure. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I like you'll probably find Pam and, and well done for doing that and, and good luck with it. But uh, you really need kind of that, those numbers and that evidence to kind of put it forward and say, yes, there, there is a problem and we need to do something about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, and um, yeah, Carolyn, she's mentioning, um, she lives in um, Cowichan and um, made um, use the livable roads for real sandage as an example um, when making a presentation to ICBC and Ministry of Transport. So it, that's awesome. Thank you, <laughs> Carolyn, for doing that. That's that's great um, having kind of that collaboration there and everything. That's that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so it's great to see some like getting some of that data and everything um, that we need. And yeah, it's, it was awesome to see in your presentation, D, the amount of data that you guys collect and everything. I know um, I have been researching how to get more data and unfortunately our police and our hospital data sets don't have that same information. But um, now we know that there are countries that do that and that maybe we can kind of go and you know, kind of advocate for that now or something like that. So, um, yeah. Is there anything else um, anybody wants to say? Or maybe we'll, we have gone a bit over time, so maybe we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, so thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. When I, when I get going. Oh, I'm no, sorry. it's all good. Yeah. No, it was, it was super interesting presentation and, yeah, super relevant to what we we're kind of experiencing here and everything. And, um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. So yeah, I think I'm just gonna check my notes if there is anything else I wanted to um, kind of say. But yeah, no, I think that was everything. So yeah, thanks so much, guys, for attending. Thank you, D, again, and um, yeah, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. Hi everyone, thank you. Bye. Thank you.